Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Underground. This is the briefing for Sunday, 19 September 2021, and it is being recorded the day prior on 18 September. So let's get right to it with the weather. So weather over the next 12 hours is going to be pretty bad for the Pacific Northwest with lots of turbulence and low-level cloud ceilings for much of the West Coast. There's also going to be some spotty low-level cloud coverage throughout the American Southeast, mostly over Mississippi, Alabama area. So that's going to be a factor for any kind of surveillance operations in the area, at least for visual surveillance. As we move forward into the winter season, the days are getting shorter and the nighttime is getting longer. So we're going to have a lot more hours of darkness to play with. So the end of evening nautical twilight, which is also known as EENT, is going to be at 8.07 p.m., uh, Eastern Standard Time for the for the Eastern uh, time zones. This will, of course, be similar for pretty much all of the other time zones as well. Also, we're right now in a green illumination cycle, so the moon is going to be very bright in the areas that don't have cloud cover, that is. And uh, even in the areas with cloud cover, there's going to be significant lunar illumination. So if you're out there using any night vision devices, you're going to have a pretty good time seeing what you're, uh, seeing what you're looking at uh, when it comes to lunar illumination. And like I mentioned, high-level clouds for the Pacific Northwest are going to be pretty pretty uh, thick over the next 18 hours. Also over the Mississippi, Alabama area uh, as fallout from some of that weather uh, rolling in over, over the Gulf Coast comes to fruition. But for the rest of the country, it's going to be pretty clear for the next 18 hours. Moving into NOTAMs, really there's only two of note, uh, one of which has expired already, and uh, so I wanted to throw it up on the screen. This is actually the NOTAM for Del Rio, Texas. Again, this one has been taken down uh, due to public backlash, but this is a, a NOTAM that was put up to prevent uh, journalistic agencies from getting pictures of the immigration crisis that's going on right now uh, at the International Bridge down there in Del Rio. So the federal government did not, did not like the fact that journalists were getting pictures of the immigration crisis down there, so they put up a TFR, temporary flight restriction, to not allow drones to fly in the area. Now, obviously, this caused a huge backlash. Actually, the uh, Texas State uh, Department of Public Safety uh, actually took up uh, Fox News journalists in their police helicopter, which can get around the NOTAM, and uh, they, so they could get pictures of the, the actual crisis down there. So uh, clearly this was a, a huge problem for the, the presidential administration. And uh, so they put a NOTAM up for special security reasons, right? So they got the FAA to put up a TFR to prevent drones from flying uh, uh, near the, the, the uh, bridge itself. And also the second NOTAM is for, uh, of course, uh, presidential operations. This is the standard presidential vacation one. Uh, Biden is spending the weekend at his beach house. So this NOTAM went into effect uh, actually as of we're recording this yesterday. So from the 17th of September to the 20th of September. So he's having taking an extra long weekend at his beach house. So that's the NOTAM for that. And then moving into civil unrest, really there aren't any major changes. Uh, I, I changed the change the map back to the normal gray color so that it wasn't so horrendously bad on the eyes, but really we're still kind of in wait and see mode when it comes to a lot of these uh, civil unrest sort of potential actions around the country. Uh, right now, number five there in Washington, D.C., uh, as this is going on, as, as we're uh, recording this here today on the Saturday, really not that many people have shown up. So it looks like uh, pretty much everybody else was feeling the same way that we were feeling about it, like it was a chance to entrap people. I mean, even Trump himself issued statements saying that he thought it was a setup. So, yeah, it, it's kind of it's kind of obvious these kind of things now. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to point that one out. But really, for the rest of the country, really not a whole lot of change uh, when it comes to the civil unrest front. All right, so moving into logistics, a uh, quick update on the microchip shortage. The Biden regime has issued permits for the Chinese tech company Huawei to import microchips from the U.S., uh, which doesn't really look good. I mean, this is coming at a time when the U.S. is short. There's a global microchip shortage of pretty much any kind of semiconductor chip. And yet we're exporting the manufacturing capabilities that we have to China. So the manufacturing world is complex and things that seem like they are horrendously bad or inefficient might actually not be. Uh, this is kind of a weird 
world to be in, honestly, with the way that, you know, globalism works now, whereas you could have, you know, a product made in one country and then shipped to 18 other countries to finish the manufacturing process, right? So I don't know the intricacies of this particular international trade sort of agreement, but it really doesn't look good at a time when the world is desperate for microchips and China is where most of them are made. So why are we issuing permits to for China to import them? So in any case, it's going to, I, I don't know if this is going to directly affect the rest of the microchip world because every chip is different, right? Every chip has a different for use and when we talk about microchips we're not we're not talking about them it's we're talking about them in extremely broad terms so it's really hard to say which chips are used for what there's millions of different kinds of chips uh, but the larger theme here is that all of them are in pretty much very short supply also the paper shortage has again like i mentioned last time gotten slightly worse a lot of, a few more publishing companies have come out and said that hey they're they're going to be entering into a time of shortage for book publication which is you know, interesting and uh, something to be mindful of as we move forward into the future. And then just briefly before we roll into critical infrastructure where I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, uh, I did want to briefly talk about the propane shortage. So uh, it looks like there's going to be potentially some propane supply chain issues moving into the winter season when demand for heating propane goes up uh, and our exports of propane have gone up quite significantly as well. So we're exporting more to other places, but our demand domestically has also gone up. So uh, that could lead to some supply chain issues moving forward into the winter season. So jumping into critical infrastructure concerns, uh, really the f a lot of random stuff today. First, uh, really around the country, there are a lot of grocery stores that are publicly announcing that they are reducing their store hours, and there's the, the long list so far that we've been able to find. Uh, you can comment below if your local grocery store has issued a statement as well, uh, but these are really just the bigger chains throughout the country that have publicly announced, hey, we're cutting our hours because of staffing shortages. Uh, uh, all of the stores here on the slide have announced that they are cutting their hours due to not having enough personnel to uh, actually man the store uh, for a long, you know, many hours during the day during multiple shifts. So this is going to be a huge problem as we move forward. You know, everyone's talking about, oh, there's a wage shortage, oh, there's a worker shortage. Whatever side of the aisle you're on with regards to what is causing this problem, it still is a problem, right? There's not enough people working in the service industries or in the kinds of industries like grocery stores and stuff. So it's going to be a huge problem when uh, stores are having to shut their number of hours. And then up next, I'm going to come back to number two. I'm going to skip it for now. I'm going to go to number three and talk about the border situation down there in Texas. Uh, so right now, it looks like there might be anywhere from ten to 12,000 uh, illegal immigrants that have uh, sort of set up. Uh, they, they're being held sort of in a camp underneath the International Bridge down there in Del Rio, Texas. So I'll go ahead and uh, throw up a video for you guys to see uh, the situation down there. Uh, it looks like there's, you know, kind of a lot of people, and this is kind of, again, highlighting the border crisis that's going on. Uh, people that live in the area or live in areas or, or states where a lot of these illegal immigrants are being uh, transported to around the country uh, obviously know that this is a problem, but if you live in some place, you know, like Wisconsin or, you know, Maine, you might not know what's going on down at the southern border and you might just think that it's just another political issue right we you know immigration is a political issue most of the time and a lot of people ignore it because they're not affected by it but i urge you to take a take a good look at what's going on down along the southern border when it comes to the numbers of people that are coming in and you can quite clearly see as this incident illustrates that it's it's moving out of the realm of politics and moving into the realm of a logistical problem, right? Well, a lot of people have saying are saying that that's been the case for years now, but you know, 12,000 people is is kind of a lot of people. So, where are they going to go? And we've got, you know, that number of people transiting over the border, you know, every hour or so for the rest of the border. So, you can look up whatever made-up statistic you want for that, but Really, the the concern is that, hey, the border's pretty much open. In a lot of places, it's completely open. 
and a lot of people are coming into the United States. And when you start adding this stuff up, it's not really so much about politics anymore, so much as about like logistics, like where are they going to go? So huge problem. Take a look at it and uh, be prepared to get into some highly polarized terrain because talking about immigration or even just trying to research it is very, very difficult to do. So moving back to Hurricane Ida, the Department of Energy actually released the products that show how much uh, Hurricane Ida impacted our crude oil production uh, in the Gulf of Mexico during that time period. And as you can see right there, it was quite a serious dip in our petroleum uh, production capabilities. So huge problem, especially considering that moving into the winter season, we're going to see propane prices skyrocket. So right now, propane prices on the on the market are the highest level since 2014 according to the EIA so that's up 120% from the same period last year so huge problem we're also exporting a lot of this propane to other countries at a time where it's not so much about trade as it is so much about having the actual supplies on hand to heat houses in emergency situations through the winter. So something to keep your eye on. I know that everybody's eyes glaze over when they're looking at charts and line graphs and crude oil production statistics and stuff like that. It's really boring and, and hard to research. However, something to keep in the back of your mind as we move forward that, hey, you if you use propane for heating or cooking, you might want to go pick up an extra cylinder uh, before we get into the extreme price increases this winter. And then moving back to the map for number five there, there was a an outage on the Verizon network across several states, actually, and across several different um, plans. So data was down, cell towers were down, landlines were down, internet connectivity was down for those that have it through Verizon, uh, stuff like that. So a lot of people were waking up because uh, it happened early in the morning and realizing, hey, I have no connection to the outside world. And this was a, a big issue for, for Verizon for a little while, uh, even though most of the time when there's a cell phone outage or something like that, people tend to forget about it pretty quickly once it's over. And they don't really realize the lesson there that, hey, when your cell, when your cell phone went down, your internet also went down and your TV also went down and, and your data plans also went down. So all this stuff being on the same network really drives home the fact that we, it would probably be a solid idea to make sure you understand how your local telecommunications networks are set up as best you can, uh, because when these outages happen, they're going to happen with no warning whatsoever. And you really don't want to be stuck uh, trying to communicate when you have no ability to do so. So something to keep in mind as we move forward into the winter season when there's going to be lots of ice on lines and things like that and a lot more outages due to the winter weather conditions. Moving forward into significant governmental actions, really the first one is uh, the Facebook. It was revealed through various sources that Facebook has a program called XCheck which has been allowing VIP users like uh, celebrities, basically people that are, you know, we know as blue check marks or the people that have been verified and they're like part of the club, right? Celebrities and things. Uh, this program allows them to bypass Facebook's censorship policies and post content that ordinarily is caught by their censorship, you know, tools and things like that. Like when your post gets flagged and taken down and stuff like that. Basically, this is a, a fast lane, right? Like a TSA pre-check through the security for Facebook's censorship tools. So, so really, this program's existence sort of confirms what we already know, that Facebook is indeed uh, censoring people, uh, some people more than others. So and if you look at the people that are part of this program, well, then it becomes a lot more clear. There are, there are the people that... Uh, are controlling Facebook, right? So, also the fallout from uh, General Milley's uh, traitorous act uh, is has gotten quite worse. Uh, actually, Trump's former acting Secretary of Defense stated that he specifically did not authorize Milley to make these uh, phone calls and things like that. So, really, what a lot of people who are in the know and and sort of in the defense community. I, really, we're not seeing hardly anybody say this isn't treason. Like it, it's pretty clear, like a textbook case of treason. Uh, Milley uh, called China and stated that he would, in fact, warn China if strategic assets were used. So, 
the fallout from this is going to be much more significant than just some guy who's may or may not get fired. I, I really don't think Millie will get fired, but I will be surprised if he does at this point. Uh, but this is going to have very wide ranging concerns, even if we might not see it right now. You can bet your last dollar that all of the other nuclear powers, at least the, the ones in the Western world, particularly you know NATO and a lot of other European powers and things like that, they're going to they're sitting down and thinking wait a second, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the United States of America was conspiring with China to stop the president from having strategic strike capabilities, right? Like, the press is going around and and saying that, oh, Milley did a good thing, he prevented Trump from launching nukes at, at something. What they don't understand is how our nuclear triad works and our strategic options. Newsflash, they're not all nuclear. That's the whole thing, is that Milley prevented strategic options being provided to the president. And that means a lot of other these a lot of these other powers are thinking, okay, um that's not good because the chairman of the joint staff is conspiring with China, one of their biggest adversaries, in a time where strategic options might be necessary. That's a huge concern. This brings back sort of the question that, that JFK asked, uh, going way back to the beginnings of our nuclear system. And the question that he asked was, how would someone know that I, the President of the United States, gave the order to launch? How would a person sitting in a silo know that the order was genuine and coming from me? And really, uh, a lot of other nations around the planet who have nuclear strike capability have also been asking that question. And really, there is no particular satisfying answer. Uh, this brings up a lot of questions about the nature of the nuclear triad, the vulnerability of the systems to a rogue general or something like that, right? Your old Crimson Tide movie comes back into uh, the debate again because these are things that we're supposed to have solutions for, but this General Milley thing is proving that, ah, no, we, we don't. Right? The fact that Milley can influence the nuclear strike capability or any other strategic asset, it doesn't have to be nuclear, any kind of strategic strike, the fact that he can influence that and prevent the man in the seat from influencing it calls into question the entire process. So you can bet that some very high-ranking staff officers are, uh, are sitting in their skiffs and wondering, okay, what do we do? Because this proves that this is a problem. This should not have been able to happen, right? One guy should not have been able to stop the president from getting anything, right? But he clearly did, and he admitted to it in a public venue. So that's a problem, and it's going to be something that I don't know that we're going to have a solid answer for, but... Just remember, this is not just some, like, the concept of a rogue general is not something that we should take lightly. This is not just everybody being upset at Millie for being a woke general, right? This is, this goes much, much deeper than that. This goes down to the very bedrock of our national defense infrastructure, right? What's the point in all these trillions of dollars worth of nuclear warheads if some guy goes woke and can affect the process? Or the other way, right? So it's this is something that, again, we're, we don't have a really great solution for. Uh, any solution is going to suffer from really the two generals problem of, of not being able to verify things and authenticate. And, man, it's just a mess that you can go down a, a really deep rabbit hole on. Um, but I just wanted to point out that, again, this Millie fallout stuff is it's not just one guy not doing his job, this calls into question the entire strategic launch capability. And continuing with the theme of uh, defense, I just wanted to touch briefly on the purges going on within the military for uh, the experimental jab, right? So there, there's a lot of stuff going on with this, and there are a lot of different chat rooms, a lot of players, a lot of groups tracking different things when it comes to the military uh, medical mandates. And there's a lot of different rabbit holes to go down. For instance, there's a huge issue between is the actual jab that the military has authorized or not? And it turns out mostly no. Re really, the jabs that the most military medical providers have is not the one that has been uh, approved by the FDA. 
they have the ones that are still under the emergency use authorization. So there's a lot of different players back and forth trying to figure out the legal implications of following an order that's not really a legal order if they can't follow it. So you've got commanders out there who are coercing troops into getting the jab, but it turns out the hospital doesn't have any of the jab that's authorized. So it's really just coercion by, you know, putting a boot on someone's neck, essentially. And this is going to be a problem for VA claims against any potential side effects because the VA is going to say, oh, you took the shot that wasn't uh, mandated, so, you know, sucks to be you, I guess, right? Much like everything else that the VA does, it basically sucks to be you. But we've seen some products floating around out there, uh, you know, among some of the, the military uh, service member groups uh, that are talking about how roughly 30 percent of troops at, you know, six bases that we've been able to, you know, kind of get our hands on. Uh, roughly 30 percent of those troops have been resisting and they're going to take the punishments like there's, a, you know, a lot of different units are doing a lot of different things. Like, for instance, 82nd announced that they're handing out GOMARS for for not getting um not getting the, the medical procedure. So for the civilians out there who don't understand what that is, basically that's the, the stake in the heart of your, of your military career. Um, uh, so there's that, you know, Article 15's flying out like freaking candy, uh, all kinds of stuff being done to all different kinds of units. It's just a mess on the military side of the house when it comes to the jab. Um, what we're waiting for, and the $64,000 question is, after all of this goes down and after the smoke settles, how many soldiers, troops, whatever, how many of these people are going to take the separation and get out of the military, use this as an opportunity to get out of the military? That we have no clue. It's probably going to be a small number, right? Probably going to be a very small percentage, uh, almost certainly going to be a very small percentage. We're not counting on this whatsoever, but... It's going to be interesting to see because that's a good metric. Like we've stated in the past, like we're, you know, this is what we're waiting on. This is a good metric to see how many people are willing to lay it all on the line because getting out of the military, ending your career um, is not something to be taken lightly. So anyone that's willing to do that is clearly in a, a uh, state of mind that they don't really have that many options left. So yeah, this is... Not a good situation for anyone in the military. It is a shame that this whole thing went down this way, but I just wanted to highlight for anyone who's not sort of in the military circles anymore um, that this is a fight that is, is one of the most significant we've ever seen when it comes to personnel in the military. So we'll keep an eye on it and we'll uh, update you as we go along. Moving on to the immigration crisis, like I mentioned, uh, the International Bridge down there has gotten a lot of press. Uh, you can just go take a look at it for yourself. Honestly, there's really not much to the story, even though you know news medias are trying to make it out to be uh, something you know, like it's a new problem. It's really not. It just so happens to be that there's a lot of people under this one particular bridge that are being held uh, so they can be processed in the United States. Really, the, the only really takeaway from this is, hey, yeah, there's a lot of people coming into the United States illegally, and we're just taking them. So, uh, I, again, the immigration issue is something that's very highly polarized. It is a huge logistical problem, um, and, but because of that polarization, because people don't understand how citizenship works in the United States or how immigration works in the rest of the world, they don't understand um, that this is a, a much larger issue when it comes to logistics and like where these people are going to go, then, you know, you think it is. So something to keep an eye on. Hopefully if we can keep an eye on it, if the uh, FAA doesn't throw up a NOTAM to prevent people from flying their drones down there again, uh, we'll, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on that. And then finally, and perhaps most depressingly for the day, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell has ordered the employees of the Federal Reserve to review ethics rules as it became public knowledge over the past week or so through financial disclosures that a lot of the regional presidents of Federal Reserve banks are cheater, cheater, pumpkin eaters. So this is a very complex topic, so I'm going to try to break it down Barney style as much as I can, but just understand that there's a lot more to it than just this. 
and it, it's, it gets really, really complicated. Uh, as we've been saying for a while now, and as most people have been saying, uh, really, if most Americans understood how the Fed, what the Fed did, uh, they would revolt over this kind of stuff. So um, the, really the short version is that last year the Fed purchased mortgage-backed bonds, which most economists believe directly led to the housing bubble, which we're experiencing right now, which has made home prices skyrocket. But, oh, looky here, Eric Rosengren, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, just so happened to both own and trade four different securities which he himself directly influenced. These securities were not conducted via a blind trust, but by him personally. So, for those that do not understand the world of economics or what the Federal Reserve Bank even is, the short version, again, is that a lot of people who directly decide and influence what your tax dollars are spent on when it comes to bailing out companies, and the same people who control large portions of the economic market decided to buy and sell stocks that they themselves had personal control over. A classic textbook case of corruption. But fear not, because statements by all of the people in this scandal are that they did not break any ethics rules, uh, which is interesting. Uh, I guess they didn't break so many rules that most of them have decided to liquidate all of their securities the moment this story broke in the mainstream media. But again, not to worry, because the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, has issued a statement that the Fed staffers will be reviewing their ethics policies, a little refresher course, if you will. Uh, which is interesting because he himself, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, held millions of dollars in municipal bonds, which the Fed just so happened to spend over $5 billion bailing out last year. So since these documents will most likely get censored quite quickly from the internet, I just wanted to point out that we have them all compiled in a nice zip file for everyone if you want to read the financial disclosures from all of the people implicated which will be available on our Odyssey page. Moving on to our mask mandate tracker, really not a whole lot of changes. Again, this is a product that is far from perfect, but it's something quick and dirty, and hopefully it helps kind of highlight what's going on. Again, states themselves, individual states is what we're tracking here, the state legislatures. We're not tracking individual school districts. If we did that, we wouldn't have time to do anything else like eat or sleep. Most states leave it up to each individual school district to decide what they're going to mandate or not mandate, but we're tracking a lot of states that are specifically requiring it for a large portion of their population, or they're banning the mandates for a large portion of their population at the state level. Uh, some states are weird because you've got places like Utah there where uh, statewide, the state law is that mask mandates are banned, but a lot of school districts are going against that. Like in Salt Lake City, they have some of the strongest mask mandates in the country. So that's kind of a, an interesting thing going on there. Similar situation in Maryland and other places around the country. Um, but yeah, this is what we've got for now. And then moving into the actual jab mandates, uh, really not a whole lot of changes to this slide. Really for now, the only place in the country that we can find that is mandating the jab for students in K-12 through schools is California. And even in California, it's only one school district, Los Angeles School Districts. So uh, if you know of any other place that is specifically requiring the jab, let us know and we'll throw it on the slide uh, for the next time. But really going through each, you know, the thousands of school districts in the United States is kind of hard to, to figure out. We're just tracking really the state level. And the California one got so much press, it's easy to track that one. And then all of this rolls into our sort of medical resistance tracker. So this is the slide from uh, that we briefed last time, and these are the updates to the slide. So uh, Arizona has been the first state to launch a lawsuit against Biden. Uh, so that we're counting that as kind of a, a specific active measure against the federal regime. Uh, a few states have taken some states back, like Arkansas has kind of taken a step back. Uh, their Republican governor, Hutchinson, uh, is clearly a fan of Biden's policies, but 
is getting upset that Biden's mandate is making it harder for him to coerce people to get the shot. So the governor of Arkansas is upset that Biden is spoiling the plans by creating such a hard and fast resistance, uh, resistance which he doesn't like. So it's weird. Arkansas has laws preventing mandates, yet their governor is just as bad as Biden when it comes to coercing people into getting the shot. So Nebraska, similar story. Their Republican governor, Pete Ricketts, said in a press statement that the shot is a personal choice, uh, but he also proudly added that his administration has been working hard to encourage people to get it. So Nebraska has a governor who publicly states that the jab should be a personal choice, but on the other hand is promoting the shot itself. So the resistance of Nebraska's political leadership to Biden's orders is unreliable at best, unlike Florida which you know, you, everyone here who's been listening to us for a while knows our our analysis on uh, on Ron DeSantis. But at least Florida is actively taking a lot of measures to prevent this kind of stuff. And speaking of Florida, I don't want to lean on this too heavily because this is uh, in the intel world we call this rumint. And there's different kinds of intelligence. Humant is human intelligence. Imment is imagery intelligence. And rumint is kind of a, a another one that's not official, where it's rumor intelligence. The rumint for Florida, which again is extremely unconfirmed, is that the Florida National Guard units might not be required to get the jab if they stay under Title 32 orders. If they go on Title 10, i.e. they're activated for federal service, they might, but it looks like the military leadership of Florida is uh, is is backing off on the, the uh, shot mandate for those kinds of troops, which is going to be interesting. If that is true and that actually does happen, this is going to be a big deal for uh, a lot of other National Guard uh, units and command structures in a lot of heavy resistance states. So we'll see how that pans out. This, again, is rumor right now, but it I just wanted to point it out because it's a rumor that's extremely interesting to be on the lookout for. And finally, really the only other change is that North Carolina and Vermont's uh, political leadership appears to be in wait-and-see mode. Actually, I think North Carolina's governor said they are in wait-and-see mode. So they're not uh, implementing any specific changes just yet to comply or resist uh, Biden's mandates. But, but almost certainly both of these states' uh, political leadership is, is definitely a fan of Biden, but they're definitely scared of things like lawsuits and uh, really the stress and problems that they have. So they're waiting to see which way the wind blows, and then they'll go with the majority um, to see what they can get away with. And moving into international issues, there is a lot uh, of stuff to talk about this week on this front, so let's get right to it. First off is an interesting tidbit coming out of Israel. Uh, well, technically Greece, I, sh I suppose, but an investigation has been launched into the plane crash that resulted in the death of Haim Geron, or however his name is pronounced. This dude was a witness, or was going to be a witness, one of the 300-plus witnesses against uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in his corruption trial. So it's very interesting that his plane crashed in Greece with him himself and his wife on board. Uh, really, everybody who has any you know brain cells to rub together thinks that, yeah, this is probably some kind of hit you know, to, to get this guy uh, off the witness list. But again... Who knows? Uh, it's really hard to say until we can kind of put the things together as to what he was going to say uh, before uh, he was killed. So, again, something to keep an eye on because a lot of shady stuff coming out about uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's corruption trial. Also, Russia is uh, launching Zapad 2021, their uh, military exercises, largest they've done in a while. Um, this is actually a, quite a massive demonstration of lots of new tactics, at least new for Russia. Maybe not new for the United States, but new for Russia. Uh, the most significant of which was a nighttime uh, airborne drop of 600 personnel, along with 40 infantry fighting vehicles, specifically the BMD-2KAUs and the BMD-4Ms. Uh, this is the largest airborne training event they've ever done. So the Russian airborne forces have proven that they can drop at least a battalion strength element all at once under nighttime combat conditions. 
This is also the first public exercise in which Russia unveiled the Sarmat II combat dune buggy sort of light infantry vehicle and demonstrated the ability to successfully deploy them under combat conditions from the backs of things like those uh, MI-17s there or MI-8s. Moving to North Korea, almost immediately after our last brief in which I mentioned the long-range cruise missile test, the DPRK conducted a second launch. Uh, this time it was a pair of KN-23s, which as you can see were launched from a train car. Uh, this is the first time that North Korea has demonstrated the capability to launch from a train car, which is very interesting and uh, definitely increases tensions on the peninsula. South Korea, not to be outdone, within just a few hours of North Korea's missile test, uh, they conducted a test of their own. Uh, South Korea, for the first time, tested their new submarine-launched ballistic missiles, or SLBMs, which is a major milestone for the international community. Uh, it actually makes them the seventh nation on Earth to actually have that technology. And they're the only one that has the SLBM technology, but no nuclear weapons to put on those missiles. So... Uh, very interesting. As one might expect, these missile tests being conducted by both the North and the South, man, tensions are really high uh, in the region yet again. Also, Japan is conducting their first national defense exercise in 30 years, mobilizing over 100,000 personnel, 20,000 vehicles, 120 aircraft, as well as a whole host of other partner nations uh, coming on board, to include the U.S. Uh, this exercise should be running until the end of November, and again, this exercise is almost certainly going to be a major factor diplomatically uh, for tensions in the region. Moving on to France, uh, lots of anti-lockdown protests and anti-medical passport protests are still going on and are increasing in severity and becoming more widespread. So we're going to definitely keep an eye on what, what France is doing over the next few you know, days, weeks, months as we move into the winter season and see, uh, see how this all shakes out for France because, as we, as we know, politicians here in the United States are really looking to see how other nations handle their civil unrest so they can get ideas for what to do here in the United States. Moving on to China. China's economy is not doing super swell. Uh, they are facing an economic crisis when it comes to real estate, specifically Evergrande. Uh, Evergrande is uh, China's second largest property and real estate management company slash conglomerate. Massive entity, right? Uh, they have currently found themselves in a pickle because they cannot pay their $300 billion debt. Um, and this is kind of a complicated issue, but think of this as China's version of these banks are too big to fail. Well, this one's failing, and they're failing big time. So this is going to cause a lot of economic strife for China as they try to bail them out or at least control their collapse so that we don't, uh, it, they don't affect uh, the, the Asian trading markets too much. Moving on down to the Sahel region of Africa, France recently announced that they killed Abu Walid uh, in the Sahel region of Africa. We don't really know which country yet. Uh, France didn't state it, uh, but it was most likely either Niger or across the border in Mali. Most likely Mali, because this is where this guy was operating. But the Sahel is pretty autonomous when it comes to the insurgency in Africa. You know, the barren desert offers lots of places to hide and lots of places to set up training bases. So uh, lots of good freedom of maneuver throughout this whole Sahel region. Abu Walid is almost certainly the Islamic State commander that directed the attack on ODA 3212 during Operation Juniper Shield back in 2017. And this was the ambush that left four Americans dead, at least one of which may have been tortured before he was executed. So Abu Walid has been a local warlord for a very long time. Uh, and he's maintained an operational area spreading from northern Mali into Niger, with most of his senior staff functions, like his, his version of a battle staff, right, being located mostly just slightly north of the town of Gao in Mali. Um, now that Abu Walid is dead, his deputy, Abdel Hakim, will most likely step in to fill that role. However, locals on the ground are reporting, at least via rumors, that he himself might have been killed in a French special forces raid in the town of Tamalat near the Niger border. So I guess we'll see how their leadership structure shakes out over the next few months. But uh, looks like a lot of other partner nations besides the United States are conducting a lot of operations in Africa, as they have been for years now. And uh, we'll see what the Islamic State does now that their, uh, their main guy in, in the region 
is uh, out of action. Moving back to Europe, uh, specifically the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch Foreign Secretary and Defense Minister have both resigned due to the fallout of the Afghanistan debacle. Uh, the Dutch uh, actually evacuated over 1,500 people themselves from Hkaya, uh, but they did end up leaving at least 22 interpreters behind. To us, this event mostly highlights that the Dutch are willing to remove their defense minister and foreign secretary over incompetence that got only 22 people left behind. And yet, here in the U.S., we are confirmed to have left behind thousands of American citizens behind, and thousands more interpreters. Yet, the only person to have been fired over this has been the one military officer that has publicly demanded accountability. So yet again, international events highlight the problems that we face here within our own government. Moving over to Saudi Arabia, the United States is pulling out most of its Patriot missile defense systems from Saudi Arabia amid the Pacific Pivot, or the shifting of resources to bolster defenses in Asia against a potential conflict with China. This has obviously upset the Saudis, as they are currently getting shot at kind of a lot by Houthi rebels in neighboring Yemen. So by removing their missile defense systems, we fully expect the Yemeni conflict to heat up a little bit, and we'll likely see some show of force indirect fire attacks on Saudi Arabia as a way of maintaining legitimacy for the rebels. And moving back to the sort of Five Eye Nations, the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia have entered into a new defense pact, uh, which is colloquially being known as AUKUS as a way of, again, pivoting to the Pacific for a potential war with China. This has soured relations with France. Uh, they are super mad. Uh, they actually recalled their ambassadors to the United States in protest over the defense pact, which incidentally resulted in Australia canceling an order for France to build their new nuclear submarines and is instead going with United States shipbuilders. Since nuclear submarines are pretty expensive, this has seriously damaged relations between France and the United States, who has always wanted to be a part of the Five Eyes community, really since it's kind of existed. So they see this as even more of an exclusive club um, that they're not a part of, and that's a problem for them on the defense front, at least that's what they think. And finally, Afghanistan. Yes, Afghanistan is still a problem. Uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of Americans still left on the ground. Uh, in fact, it has recently become public knowledge that the Taliban were holding six aircraft full of people hostage and not letting them leave Mazari Sharif, otherwise known as Mez, uh, because the Taliban didn't want any interpreters to leave, who were also allegedly on the planes. However, this, this might not be the truth. We really don't know. Uh, the Taliban have made it quite obvious, and Biden himself explicitly stated that diplomatic options were what they were pursuing. This means negotiating with the Taliban instead of a military action. So as this Afghanistan debacle continues, please do not forget that this is still going on, even though that there is almost nothing we can do to help the Americans get back home. Uh, we can certainly remember and never forget what the U.S. government did to its own citizens. So on that cheery note, uh, that's all I've got for today. Uh, thanks again for your support, and here are the sources for today's briefing. Uh, you can find the sources for this brief on our Odyssey page where the PDF of these slides is uploaded. Uh, we can't drop the sources in the description because every time we do, YouTube either deletes the video or uses their algorithms to make it less visible. So our workaround is to upload them separately for those that wish to do some research on their own. So thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.